purchase legal cannabis on the regulated market, one of the big value adds is that you know that there's been rigorous quality control testing going into that product. And, and since you're inhaling cannabis, any type of chemical contaminants have the potential to be much more dangerous since they're going directly into your lungs, directly into your bloodstream. And so even if a consumer isn't super vigilant about what they're putting in their body normally, what they're inhaling should be something that they're much more concerned about. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Cannabis Corona Report, where we speak to cannabis companies that are succeeding or helping other companies succeed during the global pandemic. And today, we are joined by Josh Werzer, the co-founder of SC Labs. Josh, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to talking to you today about the testing that you've done on rolling paper and some of the, uh, I hate to say, unsettling discoveries that you've uncovered but before we get to that, let's quickly talk about SC Labs, the cannabis testing company that you helped form about, I can't believe it's been over 10 years. You started in California, which is a state with really strict requirements. Can you explain why having third-party testing is so important? Yeah, most of our company, we weren't under testing regulations. So, you know, we've definitely done it both ways. I think they're important, A, because cannabis up, up until now was wholly unregulated. And, and just based on, you know, what we saw in the marketplace testing before regulations and after regulations, it's clear that having testing regulations has really cleaned up the cannabis supply for the consumer. Before regulations, over 50% of the flowers we test and over 70% of the concentrates we tested would have been over the limit under today's pesticide testing limits only. And it goes to show that, you know, regulations had had a major effect in cleaning up the cannabis supply. And beyond that, I believe that with increased testing, we've also seen a lot of innovation and we've seen people create products that are unique, novel, utilizing minor cannabinoids and, and things of that nature. And I, I think kind of sort of the testing industry has also spurned kind of advancement in the quality of the products and kind of the diversity of the products. Yeah, I, I know in the past, people would be like, I just want the highest THC. I just want whatever's got the highest THC. But now people are looking for the cannabinoid profile and they want to know what terpenes are in it. And, and that's a, something that you also provide, right? That information? Yeah, for sure. And I, I agree with you 100%. I think if there's maybe one disservice that testing labs have done to the broader cannabis industry, it, it's that when we first began doing the testing, the first thing we did was was test for the cannabinoid content, mostly THC and CBD. And really quickly, people looked to differentiate themselves based on THC score. And you saw a lot of cannabis strains that were really interesting that still had the desired physiological effects, but that didn't test 30% THC. And so people kind of stopped breeding them and they became really hard to find on the cannabis market. And since predominantly you're inhaling, the overall percentage of THC isn't necessarily as important as sort of the ratio of the different bioactive chemicals to each other. And so cannabis does produce cannabinoids, but it also produces these chemicals called terpenes. And they're essentially the essential oils of cannabis and other plants. And these terpenes oftentimes are bioactive themselves. They contribute to the flavor of the cannabis. And I think what we're seeing now is, is certainly people who kind of geek out on cannabis know about terpenes, but even your average consumer, they don't know about them. The advancement in sort of the chemical characterization of cannabis has allowed producers to produce products that are much more advanced, that are much more tailored to people's kind of individual needs. And so even if you're just a casual consumer, you're benefiting from this better understanding of cannabis. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's no different than the wine industry. And let's switch gears here for a second, and let's talk about how the pandemic has sort of heightened everyone's focus on staying healthy and avoiding health risks. I was just curious if you felt that customers are now more willing to pay a little more for that peace of mind when they buy legal or tested cannabis versus buying it from the illicit market. I agree. I sort of like to look at testing as one of their main differentiators from Joe who grows it in his backyard next door. And when you purchase legal cannabis on the regulated market, one of the big value adds is that you know that there's been rigorous quality control testing going into that product. And, and since you're inhaling cannabis, any type of chemical contaminants have the potential to be much more dangerous since they're going directly into your lungs, directly into your bloodstream. And so even if a consumer isn't super vigilant about what they're putting in their body normally, what they're inhaling should be something that they're much more concerned about. And so, you know, what we do is give people that kind of extra sense of safety. And beyond COVID, I mean, certainly out here in the West Coast now, we're dealing with wildfires everywhere. 
you know, we're, we're getting a lot of interest in, in kind of what, what is this going to do to the potential different contaminants that can come from all these wildfires like flame retardants and you know, heavy metals and things of that nature. Hey, if you're a cannabis company that's preparing to raise capital or an investor looking for an early cannabis investment opportunity, you'll want to tune into the Raising Cannabis Capital podcast beginning on August 15th as we simulcast the Cannabis Crowdfunding Podcast series featuring the top crowdfunding platforms. Tune in on August 15th and learn what it takes to launch a crowdfunding campaign on the Raising Cannabis Capital podcast. You know, that kind of leads me right up to what we wanted to talk about today. And that's, you know, even if you have tested cannabis and you feel real confident that what you have is pesticide-free and toxin-free, it doesn't necessarily mean that when you actually ingest it, you're not going to be exposed to toxins. And unfortunately, rolling paper seems to be one of the contributors to that. So let me just take one step back. You guys were aware of this. What prompted you to start testing rolling papers? In California, we're required to test the pre-roll and include the paper as part of the sample. So what kind of precipitated this broader study we did is we had a couple positive detections amongst different clients for a pesticide called chlorpyrifos that when they had tested the material that went into the pre-rolls previously wasn't present. So naturally, customers were a little bit concerned about where this pesticide had shown up. And so um, really quickly, we kind of zeroed in on the, on the rolling papers. Once we tested the rolling papers on their own, found that there were you know, many times what would be considered the legal California action limit for an inhalable product. So when you took those rolling papers and you rolled some cannabis up inside them, they were so contaminated that now the whole pre-roll was over the allowed pesticide limits. And since we sort of kind of got a cluster all at once for the same pesticide traced to the rolling papers, our you know, alarm bells went up a little bit. And so we, we went out and, and purchased every type of rolling paper product we could get our hands on in the market. Now, granted, we were, we were testing um, you know, consumer-grade rolling paper products, and these issues were in pre-roll cones that were more marketed towards manufacturers. And so what we found was that there certainly in some of those products were contaminants at levels that could potentially cause a joint or a pre-roll that was made with those papers to, to fail compliance testing. Wow. So, I mean, explain to me how the pesticides get into the rolling paper. Um, well, and, and so so we tested them for pesticides and for heavy metals. We tested about 120 different products, and we saw trace heavy metals in over 90% of those products, which is not in a really alarming in and of itself. I know it sounds bad, but you know, all these products are made with plant material, and plants tend to take heavy metals up from their environment and hold them in their tissue. To see kind of trace amounts of these metals in, in most of the products wasn't super surprising. But then over 10% or so of those products would have been actually over the California action limits for heavy metals. And some of them were significantly, you know, a thousand times over the limit. So a couple of the products were, were grossly contaminated. Most of them that did fail were still kind of right at that line where if you, if you roll them up into a joint, that product would probably still be under the action limit. But we did see pesticides as well. I don't have great visibility into where they would have came from, but most of these pesticides seem to be the types of pesticides that are commonly used in fumigation. So I'm guessing it's potentially fumigation of the uh, facilities where they're produced. I'm guessing that's probably where a lot of the metals contamination came from too. And some of these, you know, more grossly contaminated products, it's potentially from machinery where the papers are produced. Just like with the metals, the pesticides could show up from being applied to the actual plants from which the papers were produced. You know, it's like I said, it's something that you just wouldn't think of. I'm sure there are a lot of times where they're ingesting these toxins that they don't even know about. What advice would you want to leave us with today so that we can best protect ourselves from ingesting something we don't want to ingest? So the, the best way, I think, is sort of limit your exposure where there is potential health risk. If you go back and you buy cannabis on regulated legal market, it's going to be tested for these, these contaminants. You know it's going to be free. If you purchase these rolling papers on the side, no one's really looking. I think that's what it keeps coming back to is, I mean, tested versus non-tested shouldn't even be a question anymore. That argument should be, it should be gone. And I think you bring a new concern that people need to just be aware of. You know, I'm going to have your links to SC Labs in the show notes. And so I'm sure if people want to circle back and learn more about the report or the study that you did, I'm sure that they can circle back with you offline and Josh, this is good work. I appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with us first. And I also thank you for um, helping to keep us safe. 
Well, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it.